All right, here we are at chapter 5 of Isaiah in this series I call A Year of Isaiah here on Prophet Central. Thank you for tuning in. I hope you have enjoyed the first three videos. This is a special chapter. I have a lot to say and a lot of comments to make on this chapter. This isn't going to be a long video, hopefully, but there's still a lot to go through. So I hope you enjoy. Let's get started. As usual, we'll start with a word summary. Now in chapter five, we have 863 words, which 2% are introduction again, are neutral. Now we have 29% that are positive and 69% that are negative. So once again, we have a negative tone in chapter five. This is a song we'll see in the introduction that Isaiah makes here that this is a song from his heart and this is a very special chapter as i said that connects with us in the latter days and it connects with the redemption of zion and going back to some of the other series i've done talking about the parable in section 101 it's very important to connect these words with that section of the Doctrine and Covenants, with that revelation that was given to Joseph Smith in Isaiah chapter 5, verses 1 through 7. Now will I sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved touching his vineyard. My well-beloved hath a vineyard in a very fruitful hill, and he fenced it, and gathered out the stones thereof, and planted it with the choicest vine, and built a tower in the midst of it, and also made a wine press therein, and he looked that it should bring forth grapes, and it brought forth wild grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem, and men of Judah, judge, I pray you, betwixt me and my vineyard. What could have been done more to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Wherefore, when I looked that it should bring forth grapes, brought it forth wild grapes, and now go to, I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away the hedge thereof, and it shall be eaten up, and break down the wall thereof, and it shall be trodden down, and I will lay it waste. It shall not be pruned nor digged, but there shall come up briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah his pleasant plant, and he looked for judgment, but behold oppression for righteousness, but behold a cry. Okay, so we get imagery of this vineyard and we get a little bit of description here on what the imagery represents. But I'll keep it simple here. I won't get deep into these individual elements. It might be best to watch some other videos that I've made about this. And they're kind of sprinkled all throughout. This is an underlying tone that is prevalent for all prophecy. I mean, this is second coming. This is, like I said, redemption of Zion type of discussion here. So the summary of this first paragraph, as I break these up according to the King James Version, is here the Lord is talking about his chosen people of the covenant being set up to be the bearers of the fullness of the gospel to the world. But these people, they rebel against him. So God then destroys his vineyard and it becomes filled with money, power, and worldly lusts, all the cares of the world. And the blessings of heaven are then withheld and warnings are given to those who are the chosen lineage. Verses 8 through 12. Woe unto them that join house to house, that lay field to field, till there be no place, that they may be placed alone in the midst of the earth. In mine ears said the Lord of hosts, of a truth many houses shall be desolate, even great and fair, without inhabitant. Yea, ten acres of vineyard shall yield one bath, and the seed of an homer shall yield an ephah. Woe unto them that rise up early in the morning, that they may follow strong drink, that continue until night, till wine inflame them. And the harp and the vial, the tabret and pipe and wine are in their feasts. 
but they regard not the work of the Lord, neither consider the operation of his hands. So here I would say that this part of the prophecy is describing how the rich increase their wealth and power to be exalted above the rest of society of the earth and to potentially depopulate the earth, whether spiritually speaking or physically speaking as well. And these rich people, the successful seeking power and authority also are warned of their negligence towards God. They continue worshiping God. We must remember that they are very religious, but they grossly overlook the need to be born of the spirit and have the power of godliness truly made manifest in their life. Verses 13 through 19. Therefore, my people are gone into captivity because they have no knowledge and their honorable men are famished and their multitude dried up with thirst. Therefore, hell hath enlarged herself and opened her mouth without measure and their glory and their multitude and their pomp and he that rejoiceth shall descend into it. And the mean man shall be brought down and the mighty man shall be humbled and the eyes of the lofty shall be humbled. But the Lord of hosts shall be exalted in judgment and God that is holy shall be sanctified in righteousness. Then shall the lambs feed after their manner and the waste places of the fat ones shall strangers eat. Woe unto them that draw iniquity with cords of vanity and sin as it were with a cart rope that say, let him make speed and hasten his work that we may see it and let the counsel of the Holy One of Israel draw nigh and come that we may know it. All right, this is where I really have a lot to say now. So here, Isaiah is speaking about the members of the church being apostate and unrepentant, lacking true revelation. And they aren't progressing because that comes by the keys of the greater priesthood to essentially unlock the mysteries of the kingdom, everything that's been shut to them, even though the members lay claim to that authority of the priesthood and they claim to have prophets and apostles and honorable church leaders but because of the lack of true revelation and priesthood they aren't nourished by the meat and drink of the fullness of the gospel so they lose the knowledge they once had they are bound by the chains of hell being condemned now link that to doctrine and covenant section 84 for the latter days and so being condemned, spiritual growth towards redeeming Zion and salvation is halted, right? That's damnation. There's not sufficient progress to move forward. So everything that the church claims to be from God will be swallowed up by the mouth of hell because it's not from God. And all the prideful will be humbled and those who thought they were saved will find themselves needing to repent and change their worship of God. They have to change. The Lord's chosen people will be blessed, including the foreigners or Gentiles of the world. And many who claim to be the Lord's people are warned of continuing to deny the power of God by not leaving their sinful state behind, not putting off the natural man. And as they carry the baggage with them throughout life, they never truly repent and never receive the remission of sins. And they claim to be ready. This is the most astonishing. Claim to be ready for the second coming and all the marvelous works of God. And they speak them to come forth in almost a taunting manner, thinking that they are sufficiently righteous and repented, but they have not become godly. Continuing on verses 20 through 25. Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe unto them that are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. Woe unto them that are mighty to drink wine and men of strength to mingle strong drink, which justify the wicked for reward and take away the righteousness of the righteous from him. Therefore, as the fire devoureth the stubble and the flame consumeth the chaff, so their root shall be as rottenness and their blossom shall go up as dust because they have cast away the law of the Lord of hosts and despised the word of the Holy One of Israel. 
Therefore is the anger of the Lord kindled against his people. And he hath stretched forth his hand against them and hath smitten them. And the hills did tremble and their carcasses were torn in the midst of the streets. For all this, his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. So my commentary here is that the religious people, as I've said before, the people of God have poor discernment. They cannot discern between good and evil. And that was the example that Christ was ultimately shown to give us to refuse the evil and to choose the good. And we'll read about the example that Christ sets in chapter 7, but that's because the people need that example. They haven't learned for themselves. And that's the whole point of Christ is to show the way back to God, to the Father, to the kingdom of heaven. So by choosing evil and refusing the good, the Lord's people worship and preach corruption in the name of the Lord, ultimately taking the Lord's name in vain. They think they are wise virgins having the endowment or gift of the Holy Ghost ready to be accepted into the wedding feast. But they are warned of their mixing and polluting of their worship and doctrine. Their priesthood leaders are the ones to blame because they mingle the precepts of men with scripture. And they give promises of eternal life to those who aren't truly repentant. They are distracted from receiving the fullness of the gospel that makes them truly righteous and makes them chosen by the Lord, makes them wise virgins. The fullness of the gospel is in fact rejected and many tares end up growing within the church. People who despise the word of God, but love the word of man that appears to be godly, the precepts of men. And we'll hear more about this from Isaiah in chapter 29, I believe. And this definitely relates to the latter days as well. So ultimately the Lord ends up removing the fullness of the priesthood because of this pollution and pronounces a curse upon his people, not withdrawing his hand, leaving his hand outstretched to smite them because they continue unrepentant as a reminder that this is something I've misunderstood for a long time that God's hand is stretched out still as a reminder and fear towards him to reverence him to cause us to repent it's not a hand stretched out in mercy like the footnotes like to explain so we need to remember that verses 26 through 30 and he will lift up an ensign to the nations from far and will hiss unto them from the end of the earth. And behold, they shall come with speed swiftly. None shall be weary nor stumble among them. None shall slumber nor sleep. Neither shall the girdle of their loins be loosed, nor the latchet of their shoes be broken, whose arrows are sharp and all their bows bent. Their horses' hoofs shall be counted like flint and their wills like a whirlwind. Their roaring shall be like a lion. They shall roar like young lions, yea, they shall roar and lay hold of the prey and shall carry it away safe and none shall deliver it. And in that day they shall roar against them like the roaring of the sea. And if one look unto the land, behold darkness and sorrow and the light is darkened in the heavens thereof. Now I've highlighted a lot of this in blue as positive because this is the deliverance of the righteous, the work that the select few who are chosen will be doing. And this is where God calls his chosen people out from all over the world to repent. And they do, they, re they repent quickly and without hesitation. These few chosen will be strengthened by God as they wake up to their sinful state, their awful situation, by offering up an acceptable sacrifice of a broken heart and a contrite spirit, which will lead to them receiving the covenant promise of the gift and power of the Holy Ghost so that they can do this work. And by this endowment, they will warn all the nations of the coming destruction as the religious people, the Christians themselves, and even others in ignorance become increasingly distant from God. Now this wraps up chapter five 
I hope this has been eye-opening for you as I have described the plain and simple situation that Isaiah prophesies in this song. This doesn't seem to be a positive song, right? 69% of these words were negative, but he ends on a high note. He ends with a lot of positive words. But keep studying, keep working through these words, these prophecies, praying and seeking the spirit of prophecy for all of ourselves individually so that we can know what to do, so that we can be part of these select few who are chosen and who light the fire and bring the fullness of the gospel and deliverance to God's people. Because I want Zion to be redeemed. I want to help usher in the second coming. I want the God of this world to be put away and the God of heaven to be brought down to earth to rule and reign. So thanks for sticking around. I'll see you in the next week, chapter 6. A lot of good words that Isaiah speaks. So we'll see you then. Until next time, God bless.